for adolescents, there's this loss of control. For them, they're currently struggling for independence and identity. They're really feeling separation from their peer group more than anything else. And the way they respond, they may seem angry and frustrated. They kind of fluctuate from acting like adults to acting like children. They do need information. Make sure it's accurate and that we're not talking down to them like a child who's younger than them, but we're also not talking over their heads in terms and concepts that they don't know. They have teen time at the afternoon, and this is a really good thing. For some adolescents, their kids, I mean their peers, are not going through what they're going through. And having uh, healthy friends come and say, oh, you know, you have this tube, you have that, you know, surgery, you have whatever, can make them feel very different and awkward. They already, you know, that's part of being an adolescent is feeling different and awkward. So for some of them, feeling different from their peers is part of the problem. So being around other teens who are also in the hospital, who have also gone through this same situation, is very reassuring. Those are the teens they feel like they can connect to. Uh, again, be sure you don't condescend to them. Don't treat them like they're children, but make sure they are getting information in, at a level they can understand. And here's a peer group. Friends become really important. So what kind of effects can we see on a child for, who's been hospitalized? Well, the effects can be before admission, during the hospitalization, and after discharge. We already talked about some of those, the loss control and things. Kids can be scared and start acting up before they get in, the whole time they're there, and even after discharge. They can be really mad at the parent. The parent brought them to the hospital, let these bad things happen. The parent didn't stop them from happening, so the parent is one of the bad guys. And how a child imagines um, their illness, their concept of their illness, that's what's going to really be the predictor of how much anxiety they're going through. It's not their intellectual maturity. So a more mature child who has this crazy uh, concept of their illness is going to feel more anxious than somebody who's quite immature but doesn't have that same, you know, made up, imaginary, or just inaccurate view of what's happening to them. So, some of the risk factors that are going to make children more vulnerable to having a higher stress level at the hospital is a difficult temperament. Children who are difficult outside of the hospital are difficult in the hospital, and the stresses of hospital hospitalization kind of increase that difficult uh, behavior. And those of you who have difficult children know exactly what I'm talking about. And there's different temperaments. When you have a mismatch between the child's temperament and the parent's ch temperament, you have increased stress. So the parent deals with the stress of hospitalization in one way, the child in an entirely different way, so the two really aren't supporting each other and helping each other cope. Age, children between six months and five years have more stress during hospitalization. Males, you're going to hear this over and over, sorry males, but males in general experience higher stress than male children. Below average intelligence, so children who are um, developmentally delayed, mentally retarded, it's probably harder to give them good information that they understand. They experience more stress. And if there's just multiple or continuing stressors, you kind of get worn down over time if you're stressed over and over and over. Or if you've got social problems going on in the family, you're homeless, there's uh, marital conflict, whatever. All those stressors added on to the stress of hospitalization, those kids just they're at their limit of what they can cope with and you're going to see worse stress from the hospitalization. So what are the benefits of putting kids in the hospital? Well, the first one is getting them to recover from their illness. Uh, your book talks about a few others that I think are a little far-fetched, but um, well, 
include them, that they can increase their coping skills. They learn how to cope and get through this illness. Uh, they, you know, and stress as well. They handle stress. They learn to feel capable and competent by getting through it. And they get some new social experiences. So, okay, those are true, but um, not sure that I would put a, ho a child in the hospital for any of those reasons other than recovering from the illness. How about stressors and reactions you're going to see from parents? Because the very first thing I said was we're treating the whole family. The pa parents are just as stressed as a child. The parents feel very helpless. They're looking at the staff and often will say, have you done this before? How many times have you done this before? You as student nurses do not say, this is the first time I've done this before. It doesn't matter that you've only done it in a skills lab on a mannequin. Don't tell them that. Just say, oh yes, I know what I'm doing. Uh, reassure them they are scared. Uh, it's hard to accept the reality of the hospitalization, especially if they've been given a terrible diagnosis. Maybe the child has cancer. You tell a parent the word cancer, they hear nothing else that you say to them after that point. So that leads to the next point. They need information to be explained in simple language and they may need it repeated over and over and over because the first thing they heard stopped them in their tracks and they just really can't process more than that in, you know, at the time you're trying to talk to them and teach them. Uh, they're dealing with fear whether their child really is in danger for their life or not, they're afraid. Children are not supposed to come to the hospital in a, a you know, normal parent's view. They're uncertain. Even if the doctor's telling them they think it'll be okay, they're not sure. And so they are seeking reassurance from you. Just keep repeating it. Be accurate if you can't assure them if we're still waiting for test results, if the test still does say cancer, you can say, we're going to do the best job we can for your child. You may not be able to say your child's going to be just fine, though. So how do parents respond to some of the stress? Disbelief, guilt, anger, you know, especially if this is sudden, you'll get the denial of can't be, can't be, can't be, or they're angry. They're angry that this happened and they take it out on any and everyone, let it go. <laughs> if they yell at you, you know, it may need, mean you need to change uh, patients. Um, you certainly don't have to take that. However, realize they're at their worst, not because of you, but because of the stress response they're having to what's going on. Other parents will feel guilty. If I had only brought them to the doctor sooner, if I had only noticed. Now rarely is it the parents fault. Rarely would something have made a difference. Um, but we still, it's just natural to kind of second guess ourselves and pile guilt on. Um, another response, fear and anxiety. Their child's in pain and they can't do anything about it. Or if it's a serious illness, the fear and anxiety may be very real. The best we can do is assure them this is a great hospital, and it is, and we will give the best care based on the latest research, which we will. That may be all you can reassure them of, though. Um, they may be frustrated, especially if they're not getting information. And again, if they heard it once, when they heard a whole lot of things that they didn't want to hear, didn't want to believe, they're going to need that information again. And other parents, they'll be depressed. Uh, just about any parent would say, let me be in that bed instead of my child. I mean, it's a horrible feeling. So depression is another common reaction. Siblings. Siblings are interesting. Um, siblings absolutely are affected by a, a sick sibling or hospitalized sibling. They're lonely. Their playmate they've always have at home suddenly isn't there. They're afraid. They may, they're, the, their sibling was taken away. They don't know if they're coming back. They may die. Um, whether that's real or not, they're going to jump to all those conclusions. 
And if they're not getting accurate information, they're going to jump to worse co conclusions than reality probably is. They're worried, they're angry, and they're angry at everyone. They're angry at the sibling for getting sick. They're angry at the parents for spending so much time at the hospital with the sick sibling. They're angry at themselves for being angry. Um, they're just angry. And they resent the fact that the parents are at the hospital catering to the sick child, or jealous, resentment, jealousy, those all go together, um, and they feel guilty. I've heard kids say, particularly, you know, if it's a baby, well, this is what I've heard it said, is a toddler saying, it's my fault, I wanted them to go away, I didn't like them here. You know, they have this new baby that's taken up mom's time, they wished the baby would go away, it does, so they think they caused it. So overall, the effects on the family, we have this sense of helplessness. There, you know what, I think I went backwards, didn't I? Sorry about that. No, that just, that slide is on there twice, sorry. Um, so altered family roles. We get anger and jealousy between siblings and the sick child. The ill child can become obligated to play the sick role. The parent may treat the child differently and now the child plays, feels obligated to act sick, helpless. They take on the sick role. We want to prevent that. We want to keep these kids acting like normal, healthy kids as much as possible. Um, that's this, parents continue this pattern of overprotection and indulgent attention for the sick child, which makes the siblings angry and jealous and it can become a cycle that goes on even after the hospitalization.